I would now like to introduce you to your speaker, Diego Molina, Senior Software Engineer at Source Labs. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you all for joining us into this webinar. And I wanted to say hi in person and welcome all of you uh, to the ones who are online watching in real time, and of course, to the ones who will watch the recording when it becomes available. I really hope that you all enjoy the content that we're going to share, and more importantly, that each one of you takes something valuable from this webinar. Here to help each other in this continuous testing journey. Uh, as I said, I just wanted to say hi uh, by showing my face for a moment, but now I will turn my camera off so we can focus on the slides. And again, thank you for, for joining. All right, so let's get started. Uh, first, a short introduction about myself. Uh, I have been working in open source software for about five years or a bit more. I am really into Selenium, I am a Selenium enthusiast. I think, I feel that testing is my passion. And thanks to that and uh, the skills I have have become a Selenium contributor and committer. And I have been able also to create and, and work on different open source projects like Docker Selenium and Selenium. And right now uh, I'm working as a software engineer in Source Labs. Uh, if you want to, you can reach me out uh, through Twitter. That's my Twitter handle. Or if you want to collaborate in any of the projects I'm working on uh, in the open source world, uh, just check my, my GitHub profile. If you are in Bangalore in India uh, in a couple of weeks, I will be there in the next Appian conference. So don't be shy. Feel free to reach out and we can have a chat about testing. So let's check the agenda for today. We're going to cover different aspects of the process of jumping into automation. The first one will be about the team setup, how we should think about the configuration of our team. Therefore, after that, we're going to uh, start thinking about our testing framework. After that, we're going to think about um, what should we test uh, when we're jumping into automation, when to run those tests, and also where to run them. And in the end, all these efforts are worthless if we don't have people that join us. Uh, before that, let me tell you my story. Uh, at the beginning, I got my degree in computer science. I graduated and I got a job short afterwards as a, as a developer. And I almost had no focus on automation, on testing automation. On those times, testing was done mostly by end users. Um, and we were giving them a list of uh, spreadsheets with the test cases, expected outcomes, and so on. They were following them. And that was mostly my waterfall story. Some years afterwards, I moved to Germany and got a job as an automation engineer. I started doing API tests. And my first approach was to write automation cases for every single use case. Uh, uh, short afterwards, I started doing UI automation with Selenium, and I just took the same approach, started writing tests for every single use case, and didn't think about if this was the right thing to do or not. When I started writing more and more tests, I noticed that the tests got slightly slow. Uh, my test suite got from 20 minutes overall to something like 60 or 70 minutes. And my first reaction was, oh, I have too many tests. So what should I do? I think this is a problem of the tooling, I thought. Maybe I should improve my infrastructure. I should improve my tooling. So I spent a few weeks. I requested a few virtual machines, some resources. And then I built my own test infrastructure. I scaled it up, and the success was seen in a few in a few weeks, where I was able to uh, improve the performance of the tests. I took them down with the team together uh, from 60 minutes to again 15, 20 minutes, and then my initial reaction was, "Oh, maybe I can add more tests because I have more time to execute tests." 
Therefore, I kept writing tests for every single use case. And after a while, I found myself in the same situation. My tests are taking too much time. And this was like a vicious cycle. Then I concluded, oh, I have too many tests. What should I do? So what I ended up thinking was that I was tackling the problem in the wrong way because I never learned testing as a concept, but just like in an empirical way. Uh, so I went back to, to a previous step to think about why I should automate. And the idea of automation is to get feedback, instant feedback as fast as possible. Also to have documentation because uh, our tests should describe how our application works. And in addition to that, uh, it's a good way to catch regression uh, bugs because when we make changes to existing functionality, all these regression tests are helping us to uh, avoid these situations. And as an extra extra points to have automation, we have the opportunity to spend less time in repetitive tasks, and we can do things that are perhaps more fun, like exploratory testing. In addition to that, there is a trend in the software industry since many years ago that we are faster now developing software. So everything is moving to this direction. I bet that many of you use Jira, and if you notice it recently, I've released it, their mobile application. Uh, this is because everything is moving to the direction of having lighter uh, clients for applications, and this means that we are finding a way to speed up our releases from uh, the waterfall schema that we were doing perhaps quarterly releases or monthly releases to having the ability to do releases on demand. And for this, we need, we need fast feedback in all senses. We need to know if the changes are breaking something. Uh, and for that, we have to find ways to automate everything. And this has evolved also in the tooling that before we were using proprietary tools that we were locked to the vendor and we were using them on premise the whole time. Now we're moving to schemas where there is a lot of open source options, where we have cloud-based testing solutions and uh, we can move into this path. So let's talk about the team setup. I will discuss two different approaches. One is the case where testers and developers are together in the same team. And the other approach is the ones where testers and developers are in different teams. Let's start with the one where testers are in a different teams. Normally, when I have been in different meetups or conferences and people want to jump into automation, the first question I get is what programming language I should use to be productive as fast as possible. And in my opinion, we should use a language that has an easy setup and simple entry level, like Ruby or Python. Uh, and for me, the reason is because you can start doing productive things with a very few lines of code. You can perform complex tasks, complex tasks or uh, do a, an expression of a major concept with just a few lines. Uh, you can install them in a very simple way. And in many cases, different operating systems like Ubuntu or OS X come with this, with this programming language already installed. And in addition to that, uh, there are testing frameworks like uh, Nerodia for Python or Watcher for Ruby that are out there. Um, to support all this, uh, I was checking uh, different indexes to see what programming language was more popular. And for example, the website Global App Testing did a measurement of the amount of questions in Stack Overflow in the whole history. And just recently, now people are doing more questions or showing more interest about Python than JavaScript. And also the popularity of programming language, which is an index that measures how much a language is being searched in Google, it shows that also Python is at the top. And uh, to complement that, if we check the GitHub Octobers, we also see that Python is in the top three, together with JavaScript on Java. And 
the most recent Stack Overflow survey in 2019 uh, shows that Python is one of the most loved languages and also one of the most wanted languages. But programming language is not the only thing. Uh, when we are in different teams as testers and, and, and developers, the communication is key. We need to assure that the communication is flowing between testers, the developers, and the product owners or business analysts. And this will improve the quality of testing and team performance. Something else to take into account is that we should not aim to implement all the tests right away. There is a learning curve that we need to take into account. We need to iterate and use the free time that automation is giving us to analyze what we have implemented and apply those learnings to new tests. Uh, to complement all this, we need to report bugs in a clear way. That's how the other teams get the value from testing and especially automated testing. And we could get extra points and we could make people happier when we are providing an automated way to reproduce a bug. Now let's think about the situation where the testing role is part of the team, either as a person itself or as a, as a skill. For example, people are doing development and testing at the same time. Uh, one of the most important things here is that uh, we should take care of automation in the way that people should think about what to test and when to test all together and as a part of each activity of the development process. Something that is quite important and I truly recommend is that the test code and the application code should be in the same language because this avoids context switching. Therefore, people can be more productive and this fosters collaboration. Um, in addition to that, it's very helpful to have the testing code in the same repository where the application code is placed. And this facilitates things like testing new features that are not yet deployed uh, in production or have different configuration options that facilitates deploying in different environments. Overall, independently from the team setup, we should have things in common independently from the, from the configuration of the team. And one of them is that we need to invest time looking for a test uh, framework that helps the team to move faster. And we will talk about that as you saw in the next slides. Um, test design and implementation of the test should be part of the team. They should be part of the spirit of the team and they should be entirely a team task. Uh, and something that I find very important we do it here in SourceLabs constantly is that we need to document how our tests are structured, how the directory uh, or the folder directory is, is structured, where uh, it's going, what, what type of configuration is there, what files go here, what files go there, uh, and conceptually how to run a test, how to, run, how to add more tests, or how to remove tests, given that. Um, something that is extremely helpful is to do per programming when you're adding new tests, and especially when you're jumping into automation and to check each other's code, so to do something as code reviews. This helps a lot to learn what the other person is thinking and what approach other people are using to solve problems. And one uh, thing that is super valuable is that we should continuously evaluate if the testing cases we have are delivering value. For example, we have test cases to, to check if a web, I, web UI application is working properly in the login setup, but maybe somebody has spent time to write those tests at the API level. So maybe we can deduplicate that and only have tests in the correct layer when they deliver enough value. And it doesn't matter how the team setup starts. What is important is that we should never be happy with the current situation and we should find ways to evolve. In the past, uh, we're using waterfall where manual testing dominates. And if you're in this state, there is not a problem at all. I mean, there is always a way to improve. And it's even better because uh, you have lots of things to do and lots of ways to get started. 
At the beginning, as I said, uh, death and cure were completely separated. And when we were moving to fast waterfall, when we start going into agile concepts, we are jumping slowly into automation. And that is really helpful because there is now a flow between developers and testers that can easily lead after a few iterations to a complete adoption of Agile. Where happily this leads us to um, an automated testing uh, a scenario where it's dominating, but we're still using manual testing for debugging or exploratory testing. And in the end, what we're having is a close collaboration between Dev and QA, which uh, continues to bring us to the scenario where we're having a continuous delivery. And these functions are either in the same team by different people or the same person is able to perform the same, the same task. Um, something that is completely important is that even if we're in a continuous delivery stage or a situation, um, we are never leaving manual testing aside because when we have everything automated, we can take manual testing in the shape of exploratory testing and find new use cases to be tested and to, add, to keep adding value uh, to the pipeline. Now let's discuss briefly the testing framework. One of the most common questions I've seen is why should we have a testing framework? Mainly because uh, we, we can reduce maintenance costs in the way that a framework simplifies sharing common functionality that is needed by the team or the teams and especially by different team members. Uh, we can be faster because we, we can make changes by only changing things in one place when we have a single testing framework. And also, we can bootstrap code to write the tests uh, that, and this bootstrapping code will be provided by the framework. For example, when you want to open an HTTP connection with Rest Assured, or if you want to open a browser by using uh, WebGuard.io, all these things are, in, are embedded in the framework and they simplify a lot the bootstrapping of a new test case. And this helps to be reactive because when we have to implement new test cases, we are able to go from the test design to the test implementation in a shorter time. One of the common things that people ask is what features I should, uh, should I include in my testing framework? And there is not a complete list of that. Uh, I just added a few ones because they, I found them by asking some colleagues and I found them by checking different resources, but it's not limited to this. Uh, in general, what we should find in a testing framework is that we should be able to do assertions, we should be able to model uh, our web applications and our APIs, we should be able to have different types of um, setups if you want to run tests locally, if you want to run tests in the cloud, if you want to debug this test, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And something that is quite hard to think about, but we should spend a few minutes thinking about is these future ready features. And by this, I mean a situation where we could imagine that right now we have a web application written in Angular, for example. And for some reason, the team decides to move to React. Uh, we have to check frameworks that are constantly changing, well maintained, so they can allow us the possibility to test uh, React applications like Web Driver IO, for example. But if you use a framework that is not well maintained, that is not changing often, maybe we need to reevaluate this type of decisions. And the next question that is extremely common is how do I build a testing framework? And the easiest way is to using open source, to using open source resources, open source tools. And for example, some of the most common testing frameworks are uh, WebDriver.io for JavaScript, Water for Ruby, Selenite, or uh, Fluent Learning for Java, and Meroya for Python. Uh, but they don't come alone. They should come with a powerful reporting tool like Allure or the GHP reported that I found recently. And additionally, sometimes we need to mock different things in our environment. For example, we could need 
Tumokan API or a third party API if we're testing, for example, uh, payment providers. We could use things like Wildbog or the JSON service. And we can use different tools to fake data when we need fake addresses, fake names, fake phone numbers, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There are different projects open source, well maintained, that can help us to do that. And there are many others. So the message here is that don't reinvent the wheel. You may think that you have a unique problem, that you are the only person that can solve it, but that's not normally true. Probably many other people in the plan have the same problem and they have put efforts into putting these solutions to open source and sharing them with all the community. Now let's think about how do I choose uh, an open source tool? And mostly it goes based on the programming language that I'm using. So we have to check first that match. And second, we, if we are checking in GitHub, uh, we could see how many stars, how many forks, how active the project is. Uh, we can see that if you can create an issue or there have been issues created recently and people are replying, if there are pull requests, if support for new features is being added, and et cetera, et cetera. Documentation is extremely important because most of the time frameworks fail due to their poor documentation. So if there is a documentation that can help you to get started really easy, really fast, that's a good option for, a, for an open source tool. And most of them have uh, help or support channels in Slack or in Gitter, and then you can go and, and ask different questions. But all these things are important, but in my concept, the last two are the, the most important ones. When choosing an open source tool, this should be an effort of the team. Everyone should be involved because everyone is putting in their concept, their ideas, and their future work into choosing a, an open source tool. And also the open source concept. With the tests that you want to implement, try to write them in this uh, using this open source tool, try to use it, try to see how it works, try to see how it adapts to the workflow, and see if it's a good fit for you. Now let's move to the part where uh, we need to think about what to test. We should try to test the right thing. There is a famous comic where um, we think we want to automate everything. And we should always automate repetitive tasks to save time and effort and to be able to focus on more important things, of course. Nevertheless, we have to be aware that automation takes time and automating some tasks is a way harder way than other ones. So as any other software project, automation can have defects and these ones are hard to track. If, if you combine these things with a task that is really hard to track, this is a recipe that could be disastrous. In the end, we can spend large amounts of time uh, uh, implementing and maintaining automation if we don't think first if this should have been automated or not. That's why it's really important to choose what to automate. And the priority should be to automate tests that have high value for you to the team and the organization. Therefore, what's the right thing to test? We should aim to identify main application flows the ones that must always work, because these ones are the ones that are guaranteeing that our application, our website, our API is working. And one easy way to think about if this is an important application flow is what could happen if this feature breaks? Are we completely in an outage? Are we out of business? What could happen? And if we add automation, to test these type of flows. Are we mitigating huge risks? That's one important question when deciding something to automate. But if we're uh, out of answers, if it's really hard to get answers to these questions, we can also use analytics to get more answers. But before jumping into that, let's, let's do a small example. Let's say that we have an online shopping site and you could think about tons of different test cases. We could check if the emails are being sent, if the users can pay, if the page is responsive in different uh, devices, et cetera, et cetera. The, the list of things to test could be endless, and some of them are more important than 
other ones. But if we want to prioritize, for example, we could say users should be always able to log in, people should be always able to register, people should always pay and not eat into the basket. And if you want to buy something in an online shopping site, the product image should be also displayed. So all the ones are also important, but we should prioritize and see what are the ones that are giving us more value when we test them in an automatic way. Going back to the topic of analytics, um, many, many websites are um, having analytics plugged into them to identify how users are interacting with our site. And this can be a valuable input of information to decide what we need to test on. For example, I'm showing uh, the analytics of a simple documentation website that I run. Uh, I bet that in your uh, company, the numbers will be much higher. But what I can infer here is that uh, the top three browsers that people use to visit my, my website are Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. So I need to start thinking that I should go into a strategy of covering these three browsers. But if I want to find more information, I could also see what platforms are being are being used to access my website. And from this, I am starting to see that I need to test in Windows, I need to test in Macintosh, also in Linux platforms, and the number four is Android. So perhaps I need to consider if I should jump into a mobile uh, scenario as well for testing. But more than that, we can go deeper. We can check in analytics what type of browser versions our users are, are, are using to get to our website. And in this example, I could see that maybe I need to test in the last four versions of Chrome, use the last two versions of Firefox, and this will increase the chances of having a good coverage in my complete testing solution. But again, users have different size of screens, so I could also see this information and think about what is important to be tested uh, in my whole solution. And the list goes on and on. I could see what type of devices people are using, and I could see from what platform they're accessing us. So the main point here is that many times we feel blind about what to test and what platforms and what browsers, but almost all the time websites have analytics plugged into them and we can use this information to happily uh, create a better testing strategy. So now the question is how many tests are enough? As I said at the beginning in my story, I was writing tests for everything. So we should be careful about the decision about testing everything because in the previous example, we identify five flows. And these are important for us because these five flows are giving us value when we automate them because also they give us a sense of security in case we break something, we can detect that right away. And if I make the math and make the numbers of the analytics that I was using before, uh, I could see that easily I would test in three different browsers, two different operating systems, three different resolutions, and um, potentially in seven, seven different browser versions. If I do the math, I could end up easily with five use cases, five main flows that I am automating, but I am running them 195 times. Therefore, the question and the statement goes again to the beginning. We should automate tests that deliver us high value, especially at the UI level. This is a bit more flexible in the API level and mid test level, but when we're doing especially UI testing, we should automate value, we should automate tests that are giving us a lot of value. In addition to that, we should always remember the good practices, for example, using automated and focused tests. And this is because when you have an atomic and a focused test, it is more readable, it's normally faster, and it's more stable. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think almost a month ago, in Source Labs, we created the Source Labs Continuum Testing Benchmark. And from the millions of tests that are executed every month, uh, we got one of these uh, results that it's very, very interesting that our data mining, our data science, sorry, data science team got. And for example, if we have a test that lasts less than two minutes, it's less likely to fail. 
And for example, if you have a test that lasts more than seven minutes, it's two times more likely to fail. This means that, and reaffirms the idea that if we have atomic and focused tests, things will go better and our automation will be giving us faster feedback. Continuing with the good practices, uh, let's focus on reusability and maintainability. So let's avoid duplication of code, let's avoid unnecessary helper classes, uh, and let's keep things short and tidy. Also, tests must be independent. I should not need to run tests in an independent order. I could basically throw all my tests into a bag, shake it, and run them in a random order, and they should work. Because when we start creating dependencies, we are getting very, very close to have flaky tests and tests that are very prone to error. And something that I learned uh, like maybe one year ago, I think it was Titus, one of our solution architects, he mentioned this and I never thought about it. We should write tests and code and, and helpers, helper methods for only the current requirements. If we think about doing complex designs that consider a potential solution, a potential use case, we're going to end up writing code and code that is not going to be used in the future. And more probably, we're going to end up over engineering and over killing of a solution. And this is going to prevent us to be uh, faster results, faster feedback to our developers. And the last two things uh, are quite important, like get familiar with software design patterns. It's easy to read. It's easy to get the concept. You don't need to use them all, but just be aware that they exist and they could help you at a given point. And the last thing is super relevant for me. I have been working in tooling for many years in testing. And only in the last part, like maybe in the last two years, I realized that your testing should always be based on a plan and or on a strategy. You should not base your testing on tools. And this is extremely important because in many cases, I have seen that people choose a tool and then think about how to use the tool to test their website or test their API, etc., etc., And they end up in situations with horrendous test code, uh, projects thrown away, because basically we didn't have a test strategy. So that's the main message uh, of this part, that we need to think about the test plan first, what we want to test, what platforms, what uh, type of browsers, et cetera, et cetera. And then we think about the tool we want to use. Now let's move to the part of when and where to run our tests. Going back to the slide I showed uh, a few minutes ago, um, let's, let's uh, go one by one by waterfall, uh, fast waterfall in continuous integration and continuous delivery. And let's see how things um, could work on each environment. Uh, when we are doing waterfall, uh, we are doing testing normally in a manual way. And since we're doing testing in a manual way, we don't have enough tests to actually do testing more often. So conventionally, this happens that we're going to have a big release and everybody has to focus on doing a proper release before uh, a proper testing before the big release. Sometimes I have seen that people do bug hunting sessions. So everybody sits together, grabs devices, grabs laptops, and they do um, testing based on some parameters. But uh, it's basically because we have manual testing as a, dominated, uh, a dominating factor. So we don't have enough time to do something else. We usually use our laptops or sometimes we use the cloud. For example, in the case that we need to test in Safari and everybody has a Windows laptop. So this end has happened. And it is quite normal to have uh, shared testing environments. So we could be in the middle of our testing and a different team deploys a different service and this breaks our testing completely. So this is the current situation when we are working on waterfall and hopefully we're moving away from that. When we start working slowly into the agile adoption uh, of uh, the methodology, um, Automating testing goes step by step. And this means that we can run these tests several times per day, 
we can trigger them manually or we can have uh, our own personal uh, CI server to like Jenkins to run these tests. And normally we combine these automated tests with manual testing before releasing. Uh, and the reason for this is that we trigger the tests manually since we want to triage these results before delivering them to uh, our product owner or to the developers or to the stakeholders, basically. Because uh, we need to learn how our tests are evolving. We need to see if our tests are working properly. And that will give us uh, key points to gain confidence and to have tests that are resilient and giving us the security that they're working properly. When we are sure about that, we can move to the next stage. Uh, but before that, we need to actually double check that our tests are working since we're just getting started into automation and there is a learning curve that we, we have to cover. Um, normally, we're still in the same setup. We have shared testing environments. Uh, some other team could actually ruin our tests if they deploy something in the middle of our tests. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, depending on how critical is our pipeline, if we can have maybe downtime, uh, we have our own grid or something on-premise. But if we want to have something that is more reliable, we usually start using the cloud. When we move to continuous integration, this usually means that Agile has been completely adopted. Maybe not in a 100% correct way, but we are in the, in the Agile methodology mindset. And automated testing is getting a more important stage here. We still use manual because sometimes we need to debug some tests while we are getting confidence. Uh, and there are some maybe some edge cases that we need to double check. And finally, we're having some time to do exploratory testing because most of the test cases are automated, most of the ones that are giving us value. And this is the result of a close collaboration with the, the Rank QA. Luckily, since we have a continuous integration environment, we're able to run tests if we want on every commit, on every pull or merge request. And actually, we can do that also after merging. Normally, in this setup, we use a reliable uh, environment like the cloud uh, to have all our browsers updated, all the different versions uh, available. And we're starting to be in a situation where we have a testing environment that is special for this application, for this system under test, or exclusive for the team. So we don't have the situation so often where another team deploys and breaks our tests, but we have a more controlled uh, environment that depends only on our changes. The best part of this is that this, the fast feedback is happening through automation testing. And if we want to, we can start adding the check of passing all our automated tests as a quality gate. So when a developer or we want to add new code, new features, we could actually tweak the pull requests, the, the, the checks in the commit and say all the tests need to pass to actually being able to actually allow people to merge to, to master, for example. And the reasoning for cloud, as I mentioned before, is that the infrastructure is vital for success. We need to have reliable test cases that are resilient and, and trustable, but they are also as trustable as the infrastructure. If we have a broken infrastructure, if sometimes it works uh, or it's like really hard to configure locally, then this is a recipe for disaster. If we have an infrastructure that is reliable, confident and always up, then this is a good recipe for success. Now moving to continuous delivery is just a few steps away from continuous integration. Everything that we have is automated, but remember, we still have manual in the shape of exploratory testing because testing never stops. We always have the resource, we always we have the time to do exploratory testing to find new test cases that we could potentially automate and keep adding value to the pipeline. Um, again, we can do, we can run our tests when we commit, when we merge, when we do pull requests, and even after we release. And this means that 
we can do what uh, we do here in Sauce for example. When we deploy changes to the cloud, we run a bunch of uh, post deployment tests to double check that everything is okay. And if this is okay, we let users use our new version of the cloud. Um, and the, the, the reason for that is that since we have been through all these phases, all our tests are resilient and trustable, and we can use them in all environments. You can make changes locally and run the tests locally. You can deploy to staging if you have a staging environment and use them there. Or you can just run them in production and use them as monitoring, for example. So let's move to the next part. We have spoken about so many things that we can do, so many things that we can do as a person, as an individual, or as a team. But the most important part is that we should also uh, invite people to join us. If people are not joining us, then all the efforts we can do as an individual, they are, or they are worthless. So we're going to discuss slightly a few things on how to motivate my co-workers, how to motivate my company and my and my department. The first thing is to start by yourself. Normally, I like to talk about this um, in the terms of risks and then in the terms of actions. We are in, a, in an industry that is moving a lot. Testing is changing the whole time. Software development is changing the whole time. So if we decide to, to, to get stuck and not do anything, it's a huge risk because we're going to stay with all technologies and not being able to move forward, which basically we're going to miss opportunities to improve the testing of our product. If we automate the tests that we do every single day with browsers, maybe we have time to start playing with mobile devices. And then this opens a whole world of possibilities. Perhaps you can take your device and go into the bus, test the application while going in the bus or in the subway, uh, test it offline, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a big risk is also that we can get overwhelmed by repetitive tasks. So always doing the same thing every single day, uh, maybe it's not so appealing for many people. So what what we can do? We could, for example, talk with our managers and, and propose them something. We, why don't we, you give us a percentage of, of our time to do training? And we can make the compromise of spreading that knowledge internally. I will share some links at the end. For example, Source Labs has uh, different trainings for Appium, Selenium, and also for learning how to use Source Labs. But it's a wonderful resource to, to get started into automation in a in a practical way by seeing code, actually. You can also join online testing chats to get ideas to support. For example, the Selenium uh, has uh, Selenium uh, project has the IRC or Slack available. Atom has Gitter. Uh, our friends at the Ministry of Testing have also a Slack channel to support people into, into testing and into automation. And more importantly, you can be the agent that, that triggers all the change in your team and organization. You can be the pioneer, you can be the person to look at, and if you start doing this move internally, you will be a reference in automation in your own company and potential community. After this, we can go one level higher and find ways to motivate the team and the department. And normally the risks here are if we are separated as dev and QA, there won't be a lot of communication. Uh, this will bring confusion, people won't be uh, motivated, and normally people will have different expectations about testing. And one of the sad consequences is that people won't trust automation if we don't move into a more uh, agile and communicative way. A uh, few actions that we can take is that we could start testing earlier. We can be participant of the definition of the features and understand how a feature will work and think about how we could test that feature. We could share that with the developers and say, hey, like, uh, have you considered to test things like this or that? And this could improve the whole cycle. As I mentioned before, we can create the testing framework based on open source and this uh, express information about testing needs in the whole team. 
uh, as again, creating guidelines on what to test and what to expect about testing. This will simplify a lot of onboarding when somebody joins the team and also will increase the trust on automation testing. Something that is super important, show progress like through beautiful reports or dashboards, uh, share things that you're doing, take every opportunity in your company to show off, to show off the team efforts, uh, every sprint demo, every company stand-up, in all hands, in every meeting, in a local meetup, show what you're doing and people will start seeing the value of your work. Uh, and something that a lot of people like to do is to do these huge dashboards with big screen TVs in different uh, different rooms that you can show your test results, your dashboard, your test coverage, and this is a good way to sell automation and to and to make other people and other teams uh, a bit jealous of you. Um, and again, as mentioned before, do internal trainings uh, because as you can request help from someone else, you can also give help somewhat to other people. And this is extremely relevant when you have someone that has a little or a lot of expertise giving you a hand to get started. And to round up this part, how to motivate my company. Uh, and normally what happens is that our organization is not alone in the marketplace and the marketplace is evolving all the time. So this means that software needs to be developed faster and we need continuous testing. Uh, perhaps this could mean that testing can become a bottleneck and if it's a bottleneck, we could try to avoid it. And in the end, what happens is that the user experience of the product goes down, people are not happy. And if we treat testing as an afterthought, like as a final task of the, of the pipeline, this, this won't be a good, a good result. Uh, what we could do is to propose is to connect the business success with testing. We could check in the past what bugs have affected us and try to do the math and find out how much money we lost by not testing that. And this could be a reason to adopt testing in some more broader way. We could also do a proof of concept with testing as a business enabled, as a business enabled. And this means that we can increase the speed of uh, releases, we can do them more frequently, and this could improve the product reliability. Okay, so now let's do a short recap of what we have seen. We discussed how the team can be configured, uh, different setups. We talked about the testing framework, how to choose them, what important open source tools are out there. Uh, we so how we can identify things that are important to test when they make sense to test uh, them and especially when to run the tests and in what type of environment to run those tests and as a, as a just a recap of what we just talked about all these these efforts are worthless if they are done by one single person we always need a team to join us and to help us in the transformation pro uh, process and to end this, uh, this is a continuous test testing journey. This is something that in Source Labs we take really deep into our hearts uh, because we started, uh, as many other companies, with a culture. We, 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 from the beginning, from our creation, we changed our culture. We, we were born with a culture of testing. Everybody supporting this. And this is something that hopefully you should try to do as well in your company. And when everybody is on board with a cultural mindset, uh, the strategy comes right after what methodologies, uh, who is going to take care of what, if we need to improve our skills, then this should be the next plan. And after that, we can just do the proof of automation value. And we can see that uh, we'll have lower risk on releasing faster, we'll have more productivity for our developers and our testers, and hopefully our customers will be happy. After we have a good proof of automation value, we just scale up. We can actually test in different browsers, different mobile devices, iPads, tablets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And with this success case, we can start inviting other teams to adopt our plans as well. And in the end, we can find ways to optimize all these things. We can start using analytics to extend our tests. We can shift left to test more earlier, uh, or we can do also shift right to monitoring. 
and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In the end, the important thing that we should remember is that testing never stops. And this is uh, the journey that we have built in SOSLAB, so continuous testing. With that, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the time you have taken to be with us in this webinar. Uh, following this, I will share this list of resources. This will be recorded, so you can also check them afterwards uh, calmly. And having said that, again, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join the webinar. Uh, and right now, we're open to questions. Thank you, Diego, for that very informative and interesting presentation. It's now time for the questions. And just as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your control panel on your right-hand side. And the first question coming in is, how do we choose the right tool for automation? Great, that's, uh, that's, that's a common question I, I also get in, in my go-to meetups and, and, and other uh, conferences. And uh, the, there is no perfect tool as an overall. Uh, there is no the, the right fit as, as a global group. It is always the combination of the current situation what programming language you're using. Uh, if you want to start into a given programming language and you have help with, uh, from the developers, then all these factors that we explained while uh, talking about the testing framework are key features to identify what could be the proper testing tool for you. Uh, and the main, the main message here is that you sh we should start slowly, like step by step. Iterate is always the main key here. Choose one tool, try it, see how it can be expanded. When that works, maybe plug another tool or see if there is another tool that replaces a tool that you really have and has potential to grow. But in the end, there is not a, a silver bullet in when choosing a test automation tool. There are different options and we need to check and spend some time and think what fits more uh, for our environment. Thank you. Another question that came in is, do you have a general test plan and strategy template? I do. In the um, Well, I don't know exactly if all the details are there, but uh, I'm just going to go back one slide so people can see it again. Um, in the second link, in the Y inquiry method for test planning is an excellent blog post by the Google testing uh blog and they describe very different aspects to, to to take into account when testing uh when planning when having a strategy and they provide a few templates as well if they are not there feel free to contact us uh or reach me in twitter as well um, and i could uh, help you to find those those resources thank you and next question we have plenty of tests on Win browsers. How could we speed up test execution? Did you say Win browsers, like Windows browsers? I assume, yes, Win. Oh, okay. Um, Windows is one of the most complicated uh, environments to test on, not because it's a, it's a complicated operating system, but it's more that so far, it hasn't been able to, we haven't been able uh, in general to, to virtualize uh, this type of environment in a cheap way. Right now, uh, it's possible to do it through different combinations. There are different open source tools to do that, but uh, we also do it here in Source Labs. And, and, and what I'm, I'm trying to say is that the normal uh, way to, uh, improve testing times in Windows is, is, is to use uh, someone who is an expert in providing the, the, the machines ready to be tested. Or the other approach is to evaluate if the test cases we are running on Windows machines uh, are actually needed uh, or they could be implemented in a different layer. As I said, one example was that if we're testing the, the login feature of a website, 
we could perhaps test uh, the login successfully and, and maybe checking uh, some characteristics of the user. But if we're testing login and failed login and, and registering with a, with a wrong email and different combinations in Windows machines, perhaps these other tests can be implemented at a different layer, like the API layer. So um, that's, that's the issue with, with Windows uh, machines. They are, they are quite complicated to to scale up on your own. That's why uh, it's much easier to, to find other people who are an expert in doing that and, and just polarizing more and more as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in regards to the time, we only got a chance for one last question here, but we will get back to all the other questions open afterwards as well. And the last question for today is, should it be developers or QA engineers who automate tests? Um, that's, that's a really good question. And there is not a, 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 a final answer. In my ideal scenario, it should be a person who has both skills. But this is kind of a unicorn. Like it's very hard to find or impossible to find in many cases. So what I have found uh, that it works is that uh, in the same team there are people with uh, good skills in testing. This means that they have an understanding on what should be tested and where it should be tested. And there are people who are better into the development skills. So when they work together, uh, normally what happens after a few iterations is that the person who is able to, who, to do good development learns more about testing, has a better judgment, and the person who is working mostly in testing learns about development, and hopefully by, uh, by, by having all those iterations, we will have a person who is able to do both. So that's, that's kind of my dream, to create the unicorn that is able to do both things. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a final, there is not a final answer, there is a way to construct this scenario and it's just by sitting together, pairing, reviewing, reviewing pull requests when you create a new test, send the pull request, show it to the developer, uh, show what, what you're doing and vice versa, what the developer is implementing in the future, learn what they're doing. And, and basically learn from each other. And in the end, hopefully after iterating a few times, people should be able to do both. And with that, thank you, Diego, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave today's session, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with the link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Source Labs and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.